everybody, both in the room and online, to this second uh, session of the CCG side event series. So this is really about evidence for COP26 and bridging the gap between evidence and policy. Obviously, that's the theme for most of our side events as well, but we've got a particular reason to talk about this in this session. And we're really focusing on one of the things uh, CCG has been doing in collaboration with the UK government to try and bring some of the evidence from researchers in low and middle income countries into the policy discussions which are going on uh, during the, the Conference of the Parties. I'm Jim Watson. I'm Professor of Energy Policy at UCL at the Institute for Sustainable Resources there. I'm also Research Director of CCG, so I'm going to be chairing this session. Um, we have a couple of speakers in person, but actually most of our speakers who are the researchers that have produced some of this evidence are going to be joining us online. So welcome to you all too. I will introduce you as we go through. So the first speaker I'm going to hand over to is uh, my colleague Stephanie Hermer, who's from the CCG program at University of Oxford. She's going to talk a little bit about you know, the, this process we've been through and the, and the rationale for doing uh, the work that's going to be presented in this session and discussed in this session. So over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, hello, so I'm Steffi, um, and I just want to briefly talk about the process that we went through um, in commissioning these policy briefs, but also give a couple of points that came out of this process, or, or I, I believe are particularly important within that. Um, so as Jim said, we worked closely with the UK um, government's Energy Transition Council in commissioning policy briefs um, within five um, priority areas, these being renewable integration, regional collaboration, financing, low carbon transition, clean energy and political economy. Um, we ultimately selected 35 policy briefs that went through a long peer review process of a multitude of our colleagues at CCG. Um, and one second, I believe I have a slide. Um, and we managed to, to get um, a really good geographical spread um, of different policy briefs. Um, these policy briefs are short 1,000 to 1,500 um, word pieces that highlight key messages that come out of, of um, more deeper research. And the idea of these policy briefs um, is twofold. That firstly, um, we need to highlight key messages better to policymakers. So us as academics, we're very much used to producing journal publications that are often up to 10,000 words long. Um, and ultimately, that makes them extremely inaccessible to people that are under extreme time pressure and have to make very fast decisions. Uh, by the time these journal publications are commissioned, often several months have passed, which makes it also very difficult that these, uh, these findings directly feed into these decisions that we all need to make. And therefore, one of the things that I really highlight and probably also shout out to, to academics more generally is the need for actually making research that we are producing as academic, uh, academics much more accessible to people that do need to make these decisions. A second point that came out of this process, and Jim already touched up on this, was basically working with low- and mi middle-income country researchers. Um, and... If, you, if you're not within the academic field, there's a multitude of different barriers of, again, putting out your research, and one being that, for example, open access fees are extremely um, high. They can reach up to thousands of pounds for people to freely provide um, their research and make it, again, accessible to those particularly within um, country, low- middle-income country institutions. And so we took... Um, as a CCG, we took the role on and made um, paid for the open access fees, so basically making these journal publications more widely and freely available. But equally, I think it highlights one of the bigger issues that um, the big barriers of 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 these um, of research conducted in developing countries are being far from being accessible because of these um, high um, costs that are associated with this, um, and. I assume these were two of the key points that I wanted to highlight that came out of this process, um, but also the time point of releasing these policy briefs ahead of the journal publication, so they are actually much more timely. And particularly in this case, they fed directly into the COP26 discussion. And um, we have some speaker later from the ETC that will talk a little bit more about how important these policies, policy briefs actually were. Um, our next step as CCG with regards to this policy brief is, as I mentioned, we will um, 
they, they will become full journal or they, they're in the process of being submitted to journals where you then can access the full 10,000 words of research that are underpinning these, um, these uh, policy briefs, but also to translate them into the languages in which um, the research is focused on. Because again, we've been working with lots of uh, governments um, in, in these countries and researchers and often um, just publishing in English or having everything in English is not necessarily beneficial for bringing um, or for bridging this evidence and knowledge base. Um, and I, I guess I leave it um, there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Steffi, for setting out the context. So in choosing which speakers we uh, brought together for this session, we're actually spoilt for choice, as uh, Stephanie's shown. We've got a range of topics. We've got a range of geographies, but we've also got a range of types of research from modeling studies all the way through to more uh, qualitative political economy studies. So the mix you're going to see here today is just uh, some highlights from the, the, the people we've got involved. All of the briefings, or many of them, are now online on the CCG website. So if you want to know more about some of the other topics that we won't hear from today, then, and then please do, do go and, and, and have a look. Um, and just before we go to our first speaker, just as a reminder for anybody who's joined a bit late, either in person or online, we're taking questions via Slido, slido.com, and the code is 424241. If you go to that website, you can get in, you can uh, ask a question, or you can vote for somebody else's question, and we'll come to questions a bit later on. So uh, the first of our policy briefing uh, speakers, who I hope can hear me, um, is um, we've got Chris Matthews um, from University of Adelaide, and we've also got uh, Kali... Um, Amrush, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, from University of Mohammed uh, Polytechnic. Um, and they're going to talk about their briefing on Morocco, a key player in climate compatible growth. So over the to the two of you, um, you have 10 minutes. Um, you'll get some time checks through your, uh, through your speech. So uh, please do try and keep to time. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, greetings to you all. My name is Chris Matthews. I'm coming to you live from the land of the Ghana First Nations people in Adelaide, South Australia. And I'm delighted to be talking at this important COP26 UN Climate Summit. My co-presenter is Dr. Khalid Amarush, a Moroccan man from Agadir. We also acknowledge our collaborators, Professor Abdella Mutaki of Onhim, Professor Abdel Ali Kossia of the University of Mohammed Sis, and His Excellency Karim Medrick, Moroccan ambassador to Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Island States. It is my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Amrush to open the talk. Thank you, Chris. In the name of Allah, I would like to start by thanking Professor Jim Watson and Dr. Stephanie Permer for chairing and presenting this session. As mentioned in its title, this talk is about Morocco's opportunities toward a low carbon future, not only for the kingdom, but also for the West African region and the northern countries, mainly the European Union and the United Kingdom. With Chris, we thought of building the presentation of our policy brief on a quote from His Majesty the late King Hassan II, who is the father of the current Moroccan King, His Majesty Mohammed VI. He used to say that Morocco is like a tree with its roots in Africa and its branch in Europe. And His Majesty's hyperbola was about the Moroccan people. However, in the last two decades, his view was expanded and strengthened geog geographically, politically, and economic economically by his son, His Majesty the King Mohammed VI. And when that Morocco is a country that sits in the far northwest west of MENA region, which happens to be in the doorsteps of Europe. In fact, it is the closest Arabic and African country to Europe, UK, and the Northern uh, North America. The, the Moroccan Kingdom is blessed with uh, an abundance of natural resources, such, such, such as solar, wind, and phosphate. One should know, one should know that the country has more than 70% of the world phosphate reserves. All these resources are vital to achieve the low carbon future for Morocco, but also for its uh, potential proximity markets. Since the year 2000, the kingdom invested heavily in Africa. 
by nearly doubling the number of agreements with African countries compared with the, the preceding half century. Uh, it is now the largest foreign investor in West Africa and the second largest in the continent. These advantages are constructing a triple win structure, counting Morocco, West Africa, and northern countries, based on a two-way uh, supply chains of sustainable wealth for all parties. That is why we strongly believe that Morocco is a major key player to enable the European Union and the UK to meet their challenging climate commitments, uh, both for 2030 and 2050. Especially knowing that Morocco itself is a clear example of a nation that pursue a climate compatible growth long before many other countries around the world with economic strategies that are compatible with United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this success story, we think, could be upscaled in the region to the neighboring countries of Western Africa. For more detail about how this should be, or could be achieved, I'll leave the floor to my friend, Dr. Chris Matthew, and I would like to encourage you all to have a read through an article that we will soon publish about the subject. Thank you, Khalid. So to achieve the required emissions cuts under their climate commitments, the EU and the UK will be seeking key commodities and, and products, including green hydrogen for transport, iron making and heat, green ammonia for chemicals, explosives, and particular low carbon fertilizers, electrified transport, particularly light vehicles. And underpinning all of these uh, commodities and products is of course, renewable energy. And Morocco is in a, in a position to begin to produce these things in the near future. And these could be the fruits that the Moroccan tree can bear for northern markets while bringing value for the stable base of the tree in Africa. So to briefly discuss these commodities in a little more detail, we group three of them, hydrogen, ammonia and fertilizer together because low carbon fertilizer depends strongly on green ammonia, which in turn must be derived from green hydrogen. The red bars on this chart indicate the minimum cost of so-called brown, blue and green ammonia, with the black brackets indicating the cost range. We note that the cost of green ammonia is heavily dependent on the cost of green hydrogen, while there is a very large difference in the associated carbon emissions between the three colours of ammonia. Not blessed with abundant natural gas resources and being a large importer of ammonia for fertiliser production, Morocco is initiating programmes for green hydrogen production and green ammonia with agencies, including the International Renewable Energy Agency. Now, Europe is on the cusp of an automotive transformation. With 2030 set to be the last year that petrol diesel cars are sold in Europe, they are already responding to this policy signal with the largest year on year increase in electric vehicle sales. Now, Morocco already has a large $10.5 plus billion car industry built on strategies of incentives and special economic zones, such as, such as the one in the right-hand picture, and the massive Tanger Med port, the largest in the Mediterranean, shown in the left-hand picture with cars waiting for export to Europe. The Tanger Med port district is like the trunk of the tree, perhaps in the near future, bringing uh, electric vehicle exports to Europe. And many of the current electric vehicle batteries have LFP chemistries, with the P being phosphate. So phosphate is now a battery mineral as well as a fertilizer feedstock. So underpinning the previous four products is the need for plentiful supplies of renewable energy. And when it comes to that, Morocco is the shining light. The largest current solar installation in the world, high quality wind and hydro resources, and an ambitious target of 42% installed renewable energy capacity by 2020, which they have achieved and 52% by 2030. The trunk of the metaphorical tree here is represented by existing high voltage DC connections to Europe, the European grid with discussions around similar connections to the UK. So 
Morocco's renewable energy profile can underpin strategic low carbon production of hydrogen, ammonia and fertilizer for domestic and export purposes, while Morocco's industrial acceleration plans have created the springboard for electric vehicle manufacturing. Now, finally, and perhaps most importantly, building on wins for Morocco and its northern trading partners, there is an opportunity for a third win for Morocco's regional neighbours. Now, it is well understood that to build electricity infrastructure, one needs power offtake agreements to get finance. We suggest that Morocco's West African neighbours could, via connections to Morocco's grid, access European electricity markets, providing power purchase certainty that could help secure finance to build infrastructure in those countries. Thus, the roots of the tree reaching out across Western Africa could help bring climate compatible and sustainable development across the region in a just transition to a brighter future. So with that, we conclude our presentation and we thank the organisers and we wish every success to this all important COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow. Thanks very much, Chris, and, and Khalid too. That was great, really succinct. You got your messages across in the, in the, in the time very comfortably as well, so thank you. And uh, that Thanks. means we'll hopefully have time to come back to you with questions a bit later on. I've already seen there's a few questions coming through the Slido, which is great, so do keep them coming and keep voting, and we'll just uh, see how many we can fit in um, at the end. So we're going to turn to our second speaker now, uh, moving continents now to Asia, uh, to Indonesia. So, Saria, if you can hear us. Uh, Saria is from uh, the Center for Energy Studies at the Universitas Gadjah Mada, and he's going to talk about generation expansion planning with renewable energy targets and interconnections, a case study of the Sulawesi region in Indonesia. So, Saria, over to you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Jim, for giving opportunities for us to present uh, our work. Uh, my name is Sergio, I'm from uh, uh, Center for Analysis in South Carolina. I would like to present our work with title Generation Expansion Planning with a Renewable Energy uh, Target uh, and Interconnection. Uh, we are all from the uh, Center for Energy Studies uh, UGM. Uh, as in the background of this video, Indonesia is an archipelagic country located in tropical area. It has uh, abundance of renewable energy sources. The Indonesia government has set a target of 31% by 2050. However, the demand and supply are spread in various locations. Therefore, we need the option of an interconnection system to have a more efficient energy supply. In Sulawesi uh, Island, this is the economy of Sulawesi is projected to be grow at an average of 7.2 percent per year, and Island will be become a strategic economic region in eastern Indonesia due to the development of cement industry, especially for nickel. And then, uh, demand growth in Indonesia uh, at the average of 9 uh, percent per year. However, the Sulawesi system still faces the following problem related to the reliability, economy, and CO2 emission. In the term of reliability, the of margin is still below the Indonesian standard. And then for generation cost, it is higher than the national average generation cost. And coal-fired power plants dominate the system. The long-term generation expansion planning, which considers reliability, economy, and CO2 emission is required to solve this problem. The solar system, uh, the supply of electricity in solar system is uh, consists of two subsystems, that is Northern Sulawesi and Southern Sulawesi system. The existing energy mix of Sulawesi system is in 2019 it was still dominated by coal at 44%, followed by hydro at 18.6% and gas at 17.8%. Uh, and Sulawesi is one of the largest islands in Indonesia with enormous renewable energy resources of 51 gigawatt with the potential to generate up to 15.7 gigawatt of electricity. Uh, however, 
the rate of utilization of renewable energy in 2028 projection is only 2.1 gigawatt, which is only 14% of the potential uh, use of renewable energy in Sulawesi. And in this research, we create a model based on the open source energy modeling system or osmosis platform for developing long-term generation expansion planning. The table shows that there are six scenarios which represent the combination of business as usual scenario and renewable energy scenario target, which we combine for all northern Sulawesi, uh, southern Sulawesi, and the interconnected between southern and south, uh, uh, northern Sulawesi. Each of the scenario is evaluated based on this cost uh, energy. In this research, we use osmosis as an optimization platform for evaluating each scenario. In the face of simulation by using osmosis, we need to build a reference energy system. In this slide, in the left side is a reference energy system for uh, southern Sulawesi, while in the right hand side is a reference different system for uh, southern Sulawesi. And then the interconnection between southern and northern is connected by transmission line uh, in the level of 150 kilovolt. This is our research uh, uh, comparison uh, of the power plant uh, among the uh, scenario. From this result, we can see that the capacity in renewable and touched scenario is larger than the business as usual scenario. This is because the renewable uh, energy power plant have a lower capacity factor when compared to the fossil fuel power plant, especially coal power plant. And therefore, to generate the same amount of energy, larger capacity is required. The larger capacity can be ca can cause an increase in the generation cost in the renewable energy target scenario. And this is the result in the term of energy generation mix. From this slide, we can see that the three figures show the same trend for the electricity energy mix. In the business as usual scenario, the coal energy is the most economical to develop. However, when the renewable energy target is applied, the electricity generation from coal power plant is significantly reduced, accompanied by an increase in the electricity generation from hydro power plant and also from micro hydro power plant which indicate that hydro energy is the most economical renewable energy developed, with, uh, developed in all target renewable energy scenario. Uh, this is the electricity generation cost from uh, this simulation uh, for evaluating all of the scenario. By Im implementing the re renewable energy target in the isolated scenario, increase the average generation cost of the solar system by 4.6%. And by implementing the renewable energy target uh, in the interconnected Sulawesi scenario, it increased the generation cost compared to the interconnected Sulawesi business as usual scenario. And in the interconnected Sulawesi scenario, there are interconnection costs caused by the transmission line construction. And by developing the interconnection uh, can reduce the generation cost by 0.6% uh, in the business as usual scenario and 0.83% in the renewable energy target scenario. This is the result in terms of CO2 uh, emission. Uh, by implementing the renewable energy, uh, renewable energy target, it decreased the CO2 emission compared to the business as usual scenario. Uh, can be seen that in the northern solar system, it dropped by 35.4%. And then uh, in the southern Sulawesi, it decreased 35.8. And then the combination of the total of uh, isolated northern and southern Sulawesi, it drops uh, 35.7. When the renewable target is implemented in the interconnected scenario, and the emission of the interconnected system uh, in uh, 2050, uh, 2050 decreased 34.9 uh, compared to the uh, business as usual scenario. And our conclusion, uh, as general of our conclusion, we can say that it is more economical to achieve the renewable energy uh, target by interconnecting the two isolated systems. It is, uh, sorry, 
interconnecting the two isolated systems includes a total cost uh, this combination of generation and transmission cost of 8.36 cent uh, uh, USD uh, per uh, kilowatt hour, which is 0.83 percent less than the isolated scenario. Furthermore, uh, interconnecting system with renewable energy target provide an emission reduction of 0 0.84 uh, ton per megawatt hour to 0 0.55 ton per megawatt hour or decrease 35.14% uh, compared to the business as usual scenario in uh, 2050. And then uh, our uh, last uh, uh, height is uh, the recommendation. The government should prioritize the interconnection development between the northern and southern energy system to achieve the renewable, renewable energy target. Simultaneously, the government should encourage uh, investment in renewable energy development and more robust policy are required to support investment in renewable energy uh, development. Yeah, thank you very much for supporting uh, from the uh, uh, Climate Competitive Growth a program for supporting uh, this, this work and we are also uh, thanks to uh, UNISTAF Kajamada for supporting this, this work. Thank you very much. Uh, I will back to Prof. Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saria. That was again very clear and, and to time. And uh, thank you foremost for answering one of the questions, which is what's the three uh, insights you'd give if you had a BBC interview? And that was on uh, one of your slides towards the end already. So thank you for that. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe ask that question to other speakers if we've time at the end. Uh, so please do keep an eye on the, the questions coming through. So we're, we're now going to move for our third speaker back to uh, uh, Africa. Um, and to uh, a colleague of mine I've been working with over the last uh, year or so, I'm very pleased to welcome her, uh, Malima Mubanga from the Zambia Institute for Policy Analysis and Research. Uh, so welcome, Malima, and um, over to you for your talk. And you're going to talk about uh, Mind the Gap in Your Recovery, Why Inclusive Climate Action Matters. So over to you, Malima. Thank you, Jim. And... Um... I will start by um, just uh, stating what Zambia's uh, trilemma is. Um, okay. Um, I'm unable to control the slides. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. Can we do it remotely? And uh, next slide, please. <laughs> yeah. Next slide, please. So. Zambia's trilemma um, is basically around, we have high debt levels, and then we are also grappling with um, the impacts of climate change that have been uh, um, affecting some of the climate sensitive sectors like agriculture, um, energy, and the tourism sectors. And those are very, very critical to our uh, economy. And then you have the, the COVID pandemic now. So how do we now try to balance the scales you're talking about economic recovery uh following the the fiscal distress that we are facing and then you now have the COVID pandemic so we like jim said we are partnering on some study on a project greening the social and economic recovery in ghana and zambia and uh, what we are doing basically um is reviewing the policy landscape and engaging stakeholders that are key to the climate change and the environmental sustainability agenda in Zambia. So we started off by selecting uh, key policy and strategy documents and um, even stakeholders that are critical to the process, which uh, speak to the NDC and also the UNFCCC. Next slide, please. So just to add uh, depth uh, with uh, what we actually hope to gather from the policy landscape, we hope to capture the pre-COVID policy landscape. And uh, you know that with the COVID now, we have to have a shift from uh, 
a shift in direction, policy and resource utilization. So the context within which uh, the NDCs and NDC relevant policies were adopted, and then now looking at uh, how these um, sort of offer a synthesis of emerging themes from the selected policies that we analyze, and then link them to the NDCs and the SDGs. And um, this is with respect to the climate commitments and uh, also identify immediate uh, need to sort of try to balance off the economic and social recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. The stakeholders uh, that we engaged uh, were largely drawn from the uh, government uh, line ministries, civil society organizations, uh, uh, groups and uh, sector associations, as well as faith-based organizations. And um, like I said earlier, these were critical uh, because they play a critical role when you talk about climate change and the environmental sustainability agenda in Zambia. Next slide, please. So what came out from uh, the aspect to do with uh, the policy, the landscape policy review landscape and um, also the stakeholder engagement? We find that um, the climate change uh, impacts on uh, Zambia have been adverse really. And um, we've seen um, a rise in temperature. We have flash floods, droughts, and then there's also the increase in disease burden because of the, uh, the diseases that come with uh, uh, the rise in temperature and the floods also. So the sectors that have been impacted, like I stated earlier, include agriculture, energy, and tourism. Now, one of the measures uh, that the government has um, done is to mainstream climate change in the national domain planning processes, which we think is critical because when you talk about climate actions, it should trickle down. So at, you need to decentralize some of these aspects so that you have more, it's more inclusive in nature. And um, we see that um, at the lower level, rural level, we find that uh, in the agricultural sector, this promotion of um, climate smart agricultural practices. And then in the energy sector, we're now transitioning towards uh, renewable energy sources. And this is very, very critical when you're talking about uh, evaluation approach to adaptation. Next slide, please. Now, the key impacts that we have seen um, following the COVID pandemic is uh, economic slowdown and uh, this is because we've seen a disruption in the supply chains and Zambia is a landlocked country. So when our neighbors uh, close their borders, we are large, we are hugely impacted. And uh, we've also seen a scale done in operations in some of the sectors that I mentioned, and this has resulted in jobs and livelihoods have been impacted. And then um, next slide, please. So when we talk about recovery, the inclusive um, inclusivity aspect is very, very critical because we want to ensure that there's equity even for the vulnerable groups. So when you're talking about the women, the youth and the uh, disabled, they're really critical to this process when you're talking about climate actions. And um, this is something that we feel when you're talking about balancing recovery from the COVID pandemic and also economic recovery, it should be inclusive in nature so that we don't uh, go back to aspects that uh, uh, erode uh, environmental sustainability. Next slide, please. For the agricultural sector, which is very critical, which is key for Zambia, we feel that a robust uh, recovery in the sector um, should provide uh, an opportunity to improve the productivity, sustainability, and resilience of the local food systems. And this will also ultimately uh, increase uh, household income. And then the value chains in the agriculture sector, this is very, very critical also. But uh, we hope to see that uh, even as we talk about recovery, we need to intensify promotion of climate smart agriculture practices to help um, the farmers, the smallholder farmers to cope with uh, the effects of uh, climate change. Next slide, please. Energy is uh, an enabler. And uh, we find that uh, with the effects, the impacts of climate change, we've had a lot of load management. You know, we go 12, 19 hours without electricity. So this is critical to ensure that uh, 
we come up with um, alternative sources of energy. So provision of reliable and uh, climate resilient supply would be key in the development of a robust agricultural based uh, value chain. I should mention that our cultural uh, sector is reliant on uh, rain fed. It's, it's rain, it relies on rain. So when you talk about climate change, so we now need to transition to ensuring that uh, we move to irrigation. And then also for the sake of um, rural economic development, um, most of the, the rural parts of the country uh, are not connected to the grid. So if you're talking about light in schools, um, the clinics, and um, just even um, irrigation, we need to start to the conversation around renewable energy technology. So what does that mean? And when you're talking about this, you need to make sure that um, the communities are involved in uh, coming up with deciding what sort of uh, alternative energy solutions to work for them. Next slide, please. So what are we saying in a nutshell when we're talking about minding um, uh, the recovery? So we continue mainstreaming climate change. I think it should be um, intensified to make sure that it's inclusive in nature and then target both the COVID-19 recovery support and climate action to sectors that have green and sustainability attributes. I think this is very, very critical. And um, also the capacity building um, is very, very relevant. Uh, what we have, what we found is uh, even as we're engaging uh, players that are key in the environmental sustainability agenda, there is uh, little understanding in some sectors of climate change. So when you talk about sustainability, what exactly do we want to see? And then the research and development is also critical, information uh, dissemination, and these we feel should be added to the national and sectoral budgets because uh, it's one thing to just talk about uh, climate actions, but we also need the financing bid to really, really come out and this should um, really be priority. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, I will end here. Thank you very much, Malima. I hope you can hear the appreciative uh, clapping from this end, uh, and it's uh, transmitting to you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and um, again, we'll come back to you for, for, for questions a bit later on. So we've got two, two more briefing speakers and then a, a, a final speaker from the UK government. And just as a reminder for those who might have joined a little late, uh, questions can be asked via the Slido app, slido.com, and the code is 424241 for that. So we're now going to go to Latin America for our fourth uh, briefing speaker, Tiago Diniz um, from Electrobras. Um, and he's going to speak about uh, a briefing that he's co-written on achieving a high share of non-hydro renewable integration in Brazil through wind power and looking at regional growth and employment effects. So looking at some of those broader economic effects of renewable energy development. So Tiago, over to you and welcome. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Jim and Stefan, for this invitation. So we're going to speak a little bit, as Jim told, about renewable development in Brazil, its regional growth and employment effects. This is ongoing research by me and my colleague, Lilia. So let's go. Uh, all right, Brazil is globally known for its potential for renewable energy. And also, it's a quite success case of <clears throat> renewable power development. Uh, for example, in the last decade, basically we increased our started capacity about 20 times. And nowadays, uh, in our electricity mix, uh, we achieve about 10% of our electricity generation come from wind. Uh, this poor Brazil, it's a quite interesting position, especially when we compare with other developing countries, as we see here in this graph. Uh, and what behind all that uh, success of renewable power development in Brazil? Um, late in 20s, about two, two, 2004, <clears throat> Brazil starts its institutional uh, framework to deal with renewable energy and renewable power as well. So at the time uh, that plan and that institutional framework was basically split in two phases. The first one became RIFA goal to achieve around 
uh, 3.3 gigawatts of contract uh, with renewable energy, being 1.4 from wind power. Uh, after we achieved that, we came to the phase two, <clears throat> that uh, to achieve at least 10% of, of our electricity mix being from renewables. Uh, and how we, we manage that uh, under this program? Uh, we can look at that policy <clears throat> basically in three components. One from the demand side, uh, what I mean demand side, the government guarantee the contracts without risk and with price subsidies for this installed capacity. And we also have the financial <clears throat> arrangement, our National Development Bank, the BNDS, uh, finance up to 80% of each project inside that program and under subsidy interest rate as well. So we have demand sign, financial support, and also a development uh, component that is to require that each project inside that program uh, should have at least 60% of its companies being from local industry. So we have a development, the supply chain for green uh, industry as well. So everything was connected uh, in this framework. And all right, so under this policy arrangement, it was successful. Uh, we don't need dedicated auction for renewable source anymore, especially for wind. Uh, that high level of subsidy is no more necessary. And wind power price became competitive against traditional source. So uh, private sector is leading the investments in this industry, so everything is going well. All right, uh, but we have a component here that's <coughs> wind power in Brazil. It's located in the northeast region. That's also the poorest region in the country uh, with social indicators comparable with the least developing countries. So all that development that we had in the last decade was mostly concentrated in this region. All right, uh, so we we just have uh, our main research question. Let's see. All right, we have all that policy arrangement. We, ha we have all that development. It was quite successful. However, uh, we would like to see the social co-benefits of that and how uh, we can take lessons from this. And we asked this question basically looking uh, in a other way. We just ask, would would be the economic impact if another electricity mix was built in Brazil instead of that successful case of renewable power development? So this is basically what we do here. All right, and how we deal with that in modeling terms? Uh, we have two cases. <clears throat> One, this is what really happened. This is our baseline uh, under that policy arrangement. We have all that renewable power development. And we compare that with another scenario that was planned by the government in uh, 2010. Uh, at that time, we are still not sure that all this policy arrangement will work very well. And <clears throat> therefore, the projections at that time uh, were with uh, uh, an, an electricity mix with a little bit wind power than, than what really happened. And just a quick look in the numbers. And uh, what are we talking about, basically? When we look at the our alternative scenario, I mean, the one that was planned in 2010, we're going to see that at that time, uh, policymakers were thinking about building up around four gigawatts of wind plants in Brazil. But actually, uh, we had 13 under the successful policy case. And mostly, uh, we also use it to plan a little bit more harder in all this region. So, how are we working with all these uh, policy things? How are we deal with comparing, uh, comparing these results and so on? We approach that using a computable general equilibrium model. Uh, for those we are not familiar with economic terms, this kind of models, this CGE model, is uh, a representative of economic behavior and argent in one economy. Uh, the model we use here is the 10BR. It's a regional model, bottom up, dynamic. And we have a special model to deal with electricity market in Brazil. 
what I mean with special model. Uh, in this economic model, we could represent the electricity market and its behavior uh, through the model. We have several generation commodity in industries. We have substitution between them according to changing relative prices. Uh, also, we have elasticity for substitution. Uh, we have inter-regional trade using transmission distribution sector and constraints. And we have all these modeling things doing region by region and uh, everything is connected through trade and <clears throat> mobility of factors. And we also have 10 types of labor represented, represented according to skill level. And we also have uh, 10 household uh, classified according to incomes. So uh, when we look at, at the main results uh, a little bit, at national level, what we see if we would have been uh, a little bit wind in, under that scenario with less uh, wind power. When we look at the macro results, we see that <clears throat> uh, GDP, consumption, investment, and real range, we're gonna see decrease when we compare it to what actually happened. And when we look at regional level, we see that that poorest region, the northeast region, we're going to face uh, <clears throat> a little bit decreased investment, household consumption. Looks like our connection's gone. First technology fail. Well, that's not gone, not done too bad getting this far. Have we lost Tiago, do we think? Yeah. I mean, he was getting just towards the end, so if he does reappear, perhaps uh, if you could communicate, if that's all right, and just let him know uh, that we've moved on to our final speaker. I think that's probably what we should do, and then we can always come back to him during the Q&A. Is that all right, guys? Thank you uh, for the thumbs up. Um, so we're going to go to our, our fifth speaker from um, India this time, so back, back, to, back to Asia. Um, Sarita Suhama Vishwan Nathan is going to join us from the Indian Institute of Management and um, is going to speak about assessing the NDC and climate compatible development pathways for India. So Sarita, you're very welcome. I hope you can hear me uh, and please now go ahead with your yeah. presentation. Thank you, Jim. I hope you can hear me too. Uh, okay, great. Uh, hello, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all present and everyone joining from around the world online. It is my pleasure to present our recent study on assessing the NDC and climate compatible development pathways for India. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Dr. Panagiotis Fragos and Professor Amit Garg for the study. Uh, I would, before I start, I would uh, like to inform that this research work has been conducted under DDP BRICS and NDC aspect projects and the academic work does not in any way represent our considered opinion for climate negotiations, which is a political process and does not reflect the official policy or position of the government of India. I would briefly uh, give a, a narrative on uh, the context of India, the scenario framework, scenario results, and provide key insights from our analysis. Uh, India is the second largest producer and consumer of coal in the world uh, after China. Uh, the coal sector employs around 15 million people directly and in connected businesses. Four states or provinces of India their revenues depend on the coal royalties. Hence, the discussion on phase down of coal would be a huge challenge for a country like India. Uh, we produce 91% thermal coal and 9% uh, metallurgical coal. 94% is produced by surface mining, while the remaining by underground mining. 22 million tons of coal is imported every year, of which 55 to 60 million tons is metallurgical coal. We are the third largest consumer of energy with 14 billion units consumed every year. But our uh, per capita 
uh, consumption is around 1000 kilowatt when compared to the world average it is just uh, 3081 so it's quite less coal uh, constitutes around 56 percent of our energy mix 54 percent of our generation capacity and 72 percent of our generation share there have been projections that the uh, uh, estimates the coal will remain the major source of electricity generation for at least the next two decades we have 39 gigawatts under construction but at the same time, we have decommissioned around 20 gigawatts of power plants in the last five years. At the same time, one can see that we have ambitious renewable targets of around 450 gigawatts, which was raised to around 500 gigawatts in the Prime Minister's speech just a couple of days ago. At the same time, we are a developing country. We have 750 million people who have gained access to affordable energy. 100% of our villages have completely been electrified by 2019. But at the same time, there is last mile connectivity still left and development is in the process. Agriculture contributes to uh, the main non-CO2 GHG emissions. At the same time, 15% of our emissions is removed by land use, land use change, and forestry sector. India submitted eight national uh, uh, NDC goals, of which the three highlighted here pertain to the mitigation goals. Development has been a priority. We have mapped more than 150 climate-related policies and one can observe that more than 60% were announced post Paris, which shows India is still raising its ambitions, as we say. The most recent being the 500 gigawatts renewable target uh, by 2030. We have energy efficiency policies, uh, the 3030 target in transport where uh, all new cars would be electrified by 2030 ethanol blending, having energy efficient appliances, green buildings, uh, reducing uh, nit nitrous emissions, nitrous dioxide emissions in agriculture, uh, and also in water and waste. In this study, we have uh, analyzed two scenarios. The National Develop Determined Contribution Pathway extrapolates the trends of ongoing and planned policies until 2050, while the climate compatible development pathway proposes alternate vision of transformation consistent with the Paris Agreement, informing the short-term policies and the revision of India's NDC. We have used a bottom-up and use energy water model and soft-linked it with a top-down macroeconomic GEMI-3 model and there's a feedback loop that goes on. The main, uh, the, the first result is the emission pathway where the solid line shows the uh, emission pathways without Lulu CF and the dotted line show with Lulu CF. And from NDC to CCD, one can see there is an emission reduction of 12 gigatons when we exclude Lulu CF, and if we include, it's around 16 gigatons over 20, from 2020 to 2050. At the same time, one can observe that it is power and transport sector which shows considerable amount of uh, emission reduction. Uh, industry will remain a hard to abate sector. Building, we still have a lot of construction that will be going on in uh, as we have a housing for all by 2022. So those are some hard to abate sectors for India. The reduction, uh, the energy uh, consumption reduction in power sector is mainly due to the energy efficiency, the energy efficient technologies, increase in renewables, 
and improvement of transmission and uh, distribution losses. In, in, in industry, it's mainly due to the energy efficient technologies, shift to electricity and demand reduction. While in building and transport, it would be technology substitution, fuel switch, model shift, and also the behavioral change. Similarly, in power sector, coal dominates the energy mix. There is a share shift to natural gas and renewables. At the same time, we also observe stranded assets uh, after 2030 and hydropower and nuclear replacing the base load for coal and gas. In key insights, we conclude that India will exceed its NDC targets before 2030, but it will not be able to reach net zero in 2050 under climate compatible development pathway. Emissions will not peak before 2050 in an NDC scenario, while they may peak around 2040 in the CCD scenario. The future of coal hinges on the development of power and industry, se industry sector in the coming decade. Coal is a global concern with around 12 countries, including China, India, USA, Poland, Germany, uh, uh, Indonesia, and so on, uh, con consuming, uh, producing around 88%. But if left to our own resources, the developing countries like India would be concerned with their energy security and economic, social, political compulsions, hence may continue with coal. So we require the financial support and technologies to transition towards climate compatible development. Sectoral deep decarbonization is significantly de uh, dependent on decarbonized electricity. At the same time, there are uncertainties observed at the supply level on the type of fuel that will be ultimately used and the future development of our renewable resources based on the storage, availability of critical minerals, and the social acceptability and geological uncertainties of CCUS. At the same time, one can see that around 220 billion tons of coal would be stranded which is a total worth of around 6.5 trillion USD. But at the same time, renewable energy will offer significant opportunities through modernization of grid and creation of new jobs. So we need international cooperation and support and financial transfers to move towards a decarbonized India. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sarita. I hope you can also hear the applause from in the room here. So thanks very much. I, I mean, like many of the briefings, very topical to some of the announcements that are being made this week. I was very much reminded by your recommendation and the Indian announcement of net zero by 2070. So you are perfectly aligned, but also some of the things that had been announced for uh, action in the shorter term as well, which we may come back to you on. So I'm going to move now to a final speaker for the session. I'm really very pleased to welcome Hannah Chambers. Uh, in the room here, um, who's head of energy transition at the COP26 unit, that's in the UK government's cabinet office. So, Hannah, we've asked you to, I guess, reflect on what, what you've heard. I know you're a little late for the session. And I guess, you know, what usefulness is of this kind of evidence for the, the policy discussions you've been involved in, both in the run-up to COP at COP itself, but also what comes afterwards, because uh, COP is not the end of the process by any means. So over to you, Hannah, for, for your remarks. Then we'll go into the questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I just want to say, uh, start with an apology for arriving late. Uh, the energy theme day for COP is tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, there is a lot happening, including calls from the minister's office this morning as I was running down the street. So I'm really sorry to have missed the first presentations, but it's great to be here. Um, so, uh, as Jim said, I work on the COP26 Presidency's Energy Transition Campaign. This is focused on decarbonizing the power sector primarily um, in order to cooperate with other countries to help them in an accelerated transition away from coal power in particular, as well as other fossil fuels um, being used for power 
and how to help them scale up clean alternatives, particularly renewable energy. Um, as part of this uh, COP presidency, we set up something called the Energy Transition Council, which has been collaborating very closely with the CCG program over the past 18 months. Um, the Energy Transition Council was set up uh, in order to bring together ministers from uh, developing and developed countries, uh, um, energy experts from international agencies, the development banks and other international financial institutions and organizations, as well as through CCG, a network of energy experts and academics um, and practitioners in order to collaborate on the main challenges that Global South countries were highlighting as the, the barriers to them moving more quickly to a decarbonized power system. So the way that we've done this is we've held a series of uh, policy dialogues with um, 12 countries in Asia and Africa, um, starting with those that have the potential to um, leapfrog to clean energy, have significant uh, kind of government interest in doing so, all those countries that are significant coal-using countries but have indicated a desire to move away from that with international support. Um, and through these policy dialogues, we identified a number of thematic policy areas which countries wanted help tackling. Um, and then the CCG programme uh, took some of these inputs in order to develop the focus for these policy papers. So the five topics on which these policy papers were written are key areas that were highlighted by uh, governments in uh, Asia and Africa that we spoke to as evidence gaps that they wanted to help plug in order to accelerate their transitions. So um, I'm very grateful to uh, Mark Howells and Will Bly for introducing the, the CCG programme to us at the ETC and kicking off this, this fruitful collaboration. Um, we actually started before these policy briefings with a, a series of energy transition briefings on uh, Vietnam, which was actually written by Naomi Tan, who is in the back of the room. <laughs> uh, also uh, Kenya, Nigeria and India. And these were really critical in our early engagement with these countries. Um, in, or, in order to demonstrate to them the assembled evidence that was out there on how they could make a transition to clean power in an economically effective way while also meeting their concerns about energy security um, and uh, you know, um, inclusive economic growth and energy access. Uh, so these briefs ended up on the desks of energy ministries, our um, posts, used them in uh, early discussions and were quite instrumental in bringing these countries on board to engage in the Energy Transition Council process. Um, then these policy briefings have also been um, very useful in furthering that evidence-based uh, policy dialogue with the countries participating in the Energy Transition Council. Excuse me. Um, the, the policy briefings cover a much wider range of countries than the ones involved in the, in the council, but um, to take a couple of, of examples from the, the countries involved in the council and these policy briefings. Um, so we sent all of the policy briefings out to the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office network. Um, we also shared it with our institutional partners in the council to use in their engagements with countries. Um, and we also then worked with specific embassies um, in countries like India, Indonesia, Morocco um, that were featured today that are members of the council, uh, both the UK embassies and uh, like-minded partner governments, um, European countries, the US and Canada in particular, in order to integrate some of the findings from these into the uh, more detailed workshops that they, that they were holding with energy and foreign ministries and climate ministries on the ground. Um, and these kind of efforts to demonstrate um, very tangibly how we are responding to some of the questions that were asked of us by these developing countries has paid off in terms of real world action. So um, one of the big priorities for this campaign has been to uh, motivate more countries to come out and publicly say that they're not going to use coal power because this is one of the 
most urgent things we need to tackle if we're going to stay within 1.5 degrees of, of global warming. And um, to take the example of Morocco, when we started the policy dialogue with the Moroccan government, they said very clearly, you know, coal is part of our energy mix. This discussion is off the table. We're happy to collaborate with you on the things that we're interested in, like how do we um, become a, a greater regional player in regional energy market? Um, how do we integrate greater volumes of um, solar power in particular to our grid? How do we develop green hydrogen um, and off-grid solar for uh, industry and, and um, remote users? And um, through the policy dialogues that we had and the way that we were able to, um, through this partnership with CCG, provide evidence to answer some of their questions, also mobilize uh, technical experts to collaborate with them practically on key issues that they raised, meant that they actually, you know, they felt satisfied that we were supporting them on all of their clean energy goals, and they realized that they didn't need as much reliance on coal power in the future, and they have revised their future planning and um, have come out and, and committed to not building any new coal power and to phasing out coal power in a 1.5 degree um, uh, aligned trajectory, which is, which is really positive. And that's just one example of how um, this collaboration has led to some real policy changes. Um, so in terms of, of what comes next, um, I'm really pleased to say that the, the Energy Transition Council is going to continue beyond COP26. Um, it uh, has the mandate to continue to at least COP20, um, to at least 2025, COP30. And um, we, we really hope to continue working with CCG as, as part of that. Um, and we'll look to add uh, a greater number of, of countries to that process um, that we've piloted with, with the first 12. Thanks. Thanks very much, Hannah. That's uh, really great and uh, very good to hear both how evidence in general has fed into these dialogues, but particularly how some of the policy briefings have already uh, reached the right hands, which is actually one of the questions we've had. But also welcome the, um, the point you make about the, the Council living on for at least another few years after COP26. I think that's really, really important because clearly, you know, it's quite difficult to get through everything in the time you've had. Um, and that whole tension between timescales of evidence base and research and policy making, I think it'll be easier to bridge that given, given more time. So hopefully we can maximize some of those impacts. So we've, we've got around 15 minutes. I've been asked to finish a few minutes early, so 12.25ish uh, ish on UK time because we've got another event starting uh, at 12.30. Um, thanks to all of you who've uh, put in questions on Slido. So I'm, I'm gonna jump straight in to that. I mean, Hannah, you've already addressed that uh, second question. You can probably see on the screen in the room, it's the second one on Slido with the uh, second number, of, uh, highest number of votes. And it's basically about how do you make sure the right policy messages wind up in the, in the right desks, which just jumped to the top. Um, has CCG established links with policymakers in these countries, as in the countries that the five uh, speakers have been talking uh, about? So I'm not going to come to you for that question because you've given, me your, given us your version of the answer already. But I wonder if I... Oh, yes, we can get the screen up. I wonder if I could just ask a, a selection of our speakers. I won't ask you all each question because we'll be too long. But um, perhaps... I, I don't know. Um, the, the, the speakers who spoke about uh, uh, Morocco, uh, Khalid and Chris, um, is there anything you want to say about those links with Moroccan policymaking? I mean, Haran, Hannah has just given a very good example of, of change in Moroccan policymaking. So how do the messages that you've come up with through your research get into those hands? So do you want to go first? Uh, I'm happy to take that one, Khalid, if you like. Um, just, I, I guess uh, one of the, one of the uh, issues, and we face this issue in Australia as well, uh, uh, of course, is with renewable, now that renewable energy or renewable electricity is, is at parity with uh, fossil fuels in price, um, and there is capacity for large-scale storage. If you look at the um, the Noor Wazazat project in uh, Morocco, 800 megawatts with uh, um, I think seven or six six to eight hours of, of storage, and with uh, solar thermal having that sort of capacity plus pumped hydro, there is a strong ability now to greatly increase the uh, the capacity of of a grid to go um, above 50%, maybe much higher 
for renewables. So this does bring the opportunity now to, uh, as, as you said, Hannah, to, um, to decrease reliance upon uh, um, baseload production from coal. Um, I was going to talk about as well that uh, um, Morocco needs the hydrogen because it, it, it is a massive importer of ammonia. In fact, some of the uh, strategies that sort of were initiated in 2008, 2009, uh, meant that Morocco became a, a, a large net importer of, of ammonia for fertilizer production. So there is a strong desire to have uh, an African solution to the production of ammonia. And so the renewable electricity parity, the reduction in cost uh, brings that opportunity now. But we were going, uh, Khalid and I have just been texting each other and perhaps one of the greatest uh, achievements that uh, His Majesty, the, the Moroccan King, has has made through South-South cooperation, I guess, is, is, is education. Perhaps, uh, I mean, every year over 10,000 uh, students come to Morocco, most of them on scholarship from all across Africa. Uh, and and the, the Moroccan government makes a special, a, a, real, a real case for um, spreading its, its, um, its, its um, education uh, ability across Africa. And so Morocco is now a, a genuine regional hub. I talked about the high voltage DC connections that already exist. Once upon a time, that was for importing electricity. Uh, now it goes the other way. And with perhaps greater connection, there could be even more of that opportunity. And of course, the, uh, the port facilities that now allow them to export materials such as uh, electric, uh, hopefully electric vehicles in the future, currently uh, uh, petrol vehicles. Um, so Morocco is already a, a genuine hub for um, produ production and export into, into Europe. But we believe that uh, through the South-South cooperation and education, as well as potentially with, through West Africa, connecting across with regional grids, there could be a great opportunity to bring the other nations that are neighbouring Morocco uh, through because, as I said before, finance is so important. We know that uh, uh, um, having that offtake agreement for electricity in particular enables people to have the confidence to get finance. And um, of course, climate finance is a massive uh, issue at COP. So we believe that Morocco is a great agent for the West African region for that. Khalid, I don't know if you want to add anything or if you're all good there. Or... All I'll add about that is this type of wealth, I call it sustainable wealth, because any energy that is sold or used is coming back again compared to the fossil energy or any subsurface resources. When it is used, it's, it's, not, it's gone, it's done, it's used. And while the renewable energy actually is a renewable wealth, and that will help not only Morocco, but the regional Western Australia and uh, and uh, getting wealthier and uh, increasing the, the their capacity locally by actually selling something that will always be there and uh, the capacity of all uh, the, 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 the what we use for renewable energy is getting better and better. So the energy is getting cheaper and cheaper to be produced and that will create for this region and all for lower mid income countries, uh, what I call again, uh, sustainable wealth. And, oh, sorry, I was going to add you. one more thing if I might. Very just, quickly. just quickly, the, yeah. Yeah, sorry, the, the, the fourth factor beyond energy is agriculture. And uh, Morocco, uh, again, is, is cooperating across Africa on uh, decarbonizing or low carbon sustainable agriculture through the National Phosphate Corporation, OCP. So I, I put a plug in for that as well, because it's a very important uh, factor. Th thanks very much uh, to, to both of you. Um, Perhaps, uh, Malima, I can come to you next. I mean, first, could you just talk a bit about, you know, getting the, your policy messages into the right hands in terms of Zambian policymakers? Uh, uh, but also, there's a, a particular question about your talk about the potential for in, increasing the, the value chain for copper uh, for export and the employment and economic impacts of that. I mean, clearly, uh, copper is a big industry in Zambia. So can you talk a little bit about that and how that came up in the, in the work that you did? Oh, I think you're, you're muted, Malima. Yeah, everybody's making the same sign. Can you unmute yourself?
Yeah, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Oh, goodness. Could you try once more? Uh -huh. You can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there yes. you go. Okay, right. go right. ahead. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Jim, could you mind uh, just repeating the questions? Yeah, I've so... had some productivity issues. Okay. So, it, first, how do you ensure getting those policy messages that you presented into the right hands in Zambia? And the second, there was a question on Slido about the economic opportunities of, of uh, developing export markets for copper mining and uh, you know, what, what those impacts might be and whether that's come up in your research. Did that come through okay? Yes, please. So, as per the presentation, to get the message to the policymakers, we need to make sure that um, the processes to coming up with the climate actions, because even as we have committed at global level, we need to make sure at national level, what exactly is on the ground? What are we doing to make sure that uh, we understand what needs to be on the ground? So the inclusivity bit can work and um, just making sure that it's consultative in nature and also um, ensuring that uh, the equity in delivery is very, very, very cardinal. And uh, Jim, if you allow me, um, so the key things that have emerged from the study, the project is still ongoing, is making sure that even in our policy framework, we need to make sure that uh, the financial support towards sectors with opportunities for green initi initiatives is very, very clear. Then uh, also ensuring equity in the delivery of climate solutions uh, so that they benefit everyone. So inclusivity, uh, the vulnerable. And I did speak to the agricultural sector and you know, it caters, uh, it's a source of livelihood for more than 60% in the country. And uh, of that, we have like 7% of women that participate in that. So when you start talking about uh, climate change, the inclusivity, those are some of the things that we think the policymakers should start addressing when you talk about um, addressing adverse effects of our climate change. And then supporting the energy transition to renewable and sustainable energy sources. That one is paramount. So... Um, I know that when you talk about climate change issues, there's that policy gap, you know, communicating the climate change science into policy. I think that has always been the greatest challenge. So now we need to find a way to make sure that the policymakers completely understand what is at stake. And I think that's why we have the COP26, the super COP. So these are the conversations that we are supposed to be having. Now, um, with regards to um, the... Um, perhaps I should also add that um, we have a new administration in place and uh, we're so glad that uh, we are now leveraging with a new ministry of uh, green economy. So the policy space is now um, at least looking at making sure that even as we're talking about uh, opportunities for export growth, we talked about the mining sector. So greening the economy, what does that entail? And um, we, are, we, didn't, we haven't really covered it in the study, but it's something that we're exploring. Um, copper is going to be on demand, but we also just need to make sure that even as we are uh, extracting the copper, can we make sure that uh, the land usage and whatnot is not really affected? Because by setting up more mines, you'll find that we have to clear land. So what are we, so it's just a matter of balancing um, the aspects are uh, going forward, but uh, it is exciting. And um, our mining sector is very, very critical to running the economy. So 70% of our exports rely on the mining sector. So this is something that we really, really are looking at to address in. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we, we only have a, a short time left. So, you know, very brief answers would be appreciated. Uh, sorry, can I come to you next? Uh, there was a question uh, for you about the usefulness of open source models. So you used an open source model for the analysis you did. Um, could you just say briefly anything about how, how useful they are, how easy they are to access? Is a question to me? Sorry. No, to, to Saria. Oh, okay. Uh, thank uh, is, is uh, okay? thank you very much. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, because uh, we are in uh, Indonesia, we have a challenge uh, how to develop our uh, future energy planning with uh, because we are consist of several islands with the distribution of renewable energy is very split. In Jawa Island, which we are uh, the seventy percent of our demand is in Jawa Bali, but uh, the the energy resources, especially be uh, fossil and also maybe uh, renewable energy, is actually spread in Kalimantan, in Sulawesi, and also in Sumatra. But the issue is how to develop our future energy uh, system towards the. Uh, our president uh, said that we want to net zero emission in twenty sixty, and. Uh, we hope uh, from from using this uh, open source uh, energy platform with Osmosis, we we develop the model of developing uh, future energy future generation energy model, so we can see whether by interconnecting the uh, uh, system uh, between maybe uh, in big island Jawa, Kalimantan, Sumatra, and uh, Sulawesi, uh, which is will be have benefit for uh, developing our net zero emission. And by uh, we have used the open source energy model since several years ago because we have access uh, and uh, communication with our, our Professor Mark Howell from uh, at the time from the Sweden and now uh, moved to the UK. And we are very thanks because based on this uh, awesome uh, platform model, we can uh, use this is a free mode, uh, free platform, and then we can uh, uh, encourage our to have research uh, for developing a recent feature and model. That's I think uh, we are very appreciate to work Mark Howell for developing Osmosis, so we can use it uh, freely and uh, easily for our student and our researcher. Okay, I think thank you, thank you. Thank, thanks very much. Um, so, um, uh, Sarita, I'm going to come to you next. Um, there was a question about what do financial transfers for India's coal phase out look like? Um, I think the idea is, you know, what, what, what are the financial implications of, you know, moving away from coal on the scale that you showed? Again, a brief answer would be great. Yeah, um, the financial implications are huge, especially for coal dominated states. Uh, their royalties come from the coal mining. At the same time, we have still 54% of generation capacity, 72% generation share from coal, and 20 million people employed in the entire coal supply chain. So we are talking about stranded assets, not only in terms of coal as a resource, infrastructure, power plants, and transportation. 45% of railways revenue, freight revenue, comes from coal, as well as employment, and the families that are supported by that employment. So when we are talking about this coal transitions, we need to uh, keep in mind all this standard as well as transition risks when we are calculating the financial uh, implications of it. So the path dependencies that have been created and the future uh, path dependencies that may be there for the next couple of decades. It, it, so it's a huge implication. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I've just had people waving at me to say we need to wind up just to make sure we don't crash into the next session. So um, I'm just going to finish off, Steffi, to come back to you. And there was a question about how do we ensure this knowledge is not lost? I think it was a question for CCG or many other research programs as a whole uh, and is updated. So, you know, rather than it being for a moment and then we all move on and forget. So what's your view about that? So I think particularly for this policy briefing series, I mean, um, we will, as, as Hannah had mentioned, we will continue working with the ETC and also um, now comes the step of actually translating it into the languages um, and make it more accessible, but also sharing it much better. But at, at the end of the day, I would say it forms the first step and uh, the first baseline. And, and as any research builds on other research, we hope to develop and continue this over the years to come. Um, so, and it's available on our website as well, and we will push it out a bit more. But I, I assume it's just the first start for many of the topics, and we hope that um, it provides the starting point. 
Thanks very much, Steffi. I'm afraid we've got to leave it there. Apologies to people who'd asked questions that didn't get answered. But um, uh, first, thank you very much to all our speakers online. We really appreciate it. And it, it, it almost went without technical hitches. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks to Steffi and to Hannah for joining us in the room. And please uh, thank everybody in the usual way.